I have it. It's like their media or something. Okay. Um, I'll Good afternoon and welcome to Liberal Hall. This is the original Wasatch Academy School Building and now it's Historic Museum. My name is Laura Pernow and I am a visual arts faculty member here at Wasatch Academy. We are excited to have Dr. Anita Wright here today. Dr. Wright is here to speak about the power of art in our lives. This project is supported in part by the Utah Arts and Museums with funding from the State of Utah and the National Endowment for the Arts. Rita Wright is the director of the Springville Art Museum in Springville, Utah. The museum's collection focuses on Utah art with smaller collections of American and Russian art. It also hosts the annual Utah All-State High School Art Show, a juried exhibition which showcases the best student work from high school juniors and seniors throughout the state. Each year, our own students enter the show, and this year we had four student pieces accepted and two receiving awards from the jury. Dr. Wright received her PhD from the University of Utah in European History with ancient and art history minors. Her ongoing research includes the experience of art in religious and museum space, religious slash interfaith art, and the artists working within these genres. Dr. Wright's work at the Springville Museum of Art makes her one of the leading experts and champions of student art here in Utah. We are excited to have her here today. We hope you will join us after for an informal question and answer period, and pizza will be delivered to the museum. Please join me in giving a warm welcome for Dr. Wright. This is a treat for me to be here. I have been here, down here several times, and of course I've had your students up at the museum, and I just consider it an honor to be here. When I hear her say such nice things, I think, oh man, the nice things are having students and teachers who love art and are encouraging students to do that. So thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Yes. But there we go. Okay, and let's make sure to that. All right. I decided to use the title Coming to Your Senses because I feel like we are whole human beings and we can't isolate one part of us as we especially look at art. And a lot of my research has covered the idea that the whole human engages with a work of art. It's not just intellectually, it's not just the movement an optical movement of the eye. It's the idea that all of our senses need to be part of the arts. Am I loud enough so far? Yeah. And so it's not just art, it is the art of living, both appreciating art and creating art. And I'm tickled when I see students here. Thank you for coming because you are the ones that we'll be talking about in a few years. Actually, we do now. So I'm going to share this work of art, which is one of my favorites. It's been a favorite from a long time, even before I took an Italian art history class. And this, of course, is the Delphic Sibyl from the Sistine Chapel ceiling by Michelangelo. When you look at her, she's everything of grace and elegance and beauty. The colors he used, that blue around her head and the white band that almost seems like a little bit of a corona or crown in there. But what I want to talk about today is the part of her that is not serene or passive. It's the look as she looks over her shoulder, looking at her hair. She is entirely aware and engaged with something else that's going on. And that's what I'd like to have us notice. Here we can see she's got little Pooty back here helping read. She's got a scroll that's been unfolded as her hand rests on her lap. But there's very much that action of opening the scroll. She's looking over her shoulder as a prophetess of sorts, which the ancient Sibyls were in the Greek world. And probably the first we read about the Delphic Sibyl is maybe in 1500 BC. And so as we look at her, we're seeing that she is aware of something to come. In the story that Michelangelo was using here, 
It was the idea that not only the ancient prophets of the Old Testament, but sibyls and oracles and prophets of the ancient pagan world were aware of the coming of Jesus Christ. So she is looking in anticipation at that. But I want us to talk about what it means to be engaged. Now here's another painting in the, from the 19th century, so about 300 years after Michelangelo, where he is depicting one of her oracles, one of her speakers. And it's interesting because in the 19th century, as they were studying the ancient world, they came to understand a little bit about what was going on at Delphi, where the oracle would speak. And it was kind of a divine madness, as some of the ancient writers talked about, because as we look at this description by Virgil, her face nor hue went untransformed, her breast heaved, her wild heart grew large with passion, taller to their eyes, sounding no longer mortal. She prophesied what was inspired from the God breathing near. As scholars have looked at that, many today believe that she was situated over a crevice in the earth out of which vapors came. She delivered the answers of the gods to such as came to consult the oracle was supposed to be suddenly inspired by the sulfurious vapors which issued from the hole of a subterraneous <coughs> cavity. So we're seeing here that we've got science, archaeology, anthropology, study, as, as you do in literature classes, when we look at some of those question answers that we develop, but at the same time, a work of art is not just about answers. In looking at the symbol, that serenity combined with very active energy in her body as she undoes the scroll. Above the Delphic Oracle in Greek was the phrase that we use very lightly now, know thyself. But over generations, it has meant get to know yourself and the world around you in order to know yourself better. This is a work by a 19th century artist, Frederick Lighton. Look back at the symbol, same kind of colors. He was very influenced by Michelangelo. Look at that orange that's draped across her lap. Now look at this figure. This is a very famous painting called Flaming June. And it's a woman that has spread herself out in kind of an ennui or boredom with life that was very popular in the Victorian period to show people who were so bored with having nothing to do. So in contrast to the Delphic Sibyl and that alertness and being aware, Flaming June is just there resting. Is that important? Yes, ask me about it sometime. Resting is a very good thing. But the idea was there was nothing to do. And so as we talk about art today, there is much to do. Familiar with the terms aesthetic and anesthetic? What is an anesthesia? We've got some moms in here. What is anesthesia? It puts you to sleep. It puts you to sleep. It numbs you. So an aesthetic enlivens you, helps you understand things more, enlivens your whole body. A doctor applies an anesthetic when she wants the patient to feel nothing. But we're not about feeling nothing anymore. It's very important to us to acknowledge what we're feeling so we can deal with the world and life around us. If aesthetic is numbness, anesthetic is numbness, and aesthetic awareness, I love this, I have not read this till the other day, is a door to wonderment. And I believe that's the way we encounter art. We want to always approach a work of art as something new. I've seen Stansfields, I've looked at them, but I want to each time approach it with a whole new perspective. Sometimes, and this is from Alan Langer's Mindfulness, when our minds are set on one thing or on one way of doing things, anybody know somebody like that? <laughs> yes, laugh. Mindlessly determined in the past. I hear that every week at City Council. We've got to keep Springville traditional. We've got to do what's been done in Springville. Important, yes. However, sometimes when we do that, we blot out intuition 
and miss much of the present world around us. We find that happens because we are not open to the richness of new things. So mindfulness is that meditative state of being when we're fully aware of the moment and being self-conscious and being present. When I talk to students, they love to use the word, I feel present. They're engaged, their minds, their hearts, their bodies. So we develop that as an important aspect now in the way we approach art. And any of you can go to a museum. I had one of my students from UVU the other day who wrote me said, I'm going to the Met. Tell me what to go see. <laughs> And I said, you can go to the website for that. It can tell you the most important things in the world of art that you want to see. What I'm encouraging you to is walk into a gallery, look at something that appeals to you, go over and look at it for a minute before you even look at the title or the artist, and figure out why you're responding to it that way. Anthony Lawler is an architect, and I found that a lot of his writings I've incorporated into the art experience. He said, because we are so often unmindful of the spaces that we are in, when we do happen across an ancient cathedral in the midst of a city, or find a garden aligned with the rising and setting of the sun, most of us do not have the eyes to recognize the signals they are giving us. And in this way, he's talking about mindful, present eyes. The whole of us don't even recognize the signals. I stand in a place like this, and I think about all the others that have congregated here. I think about people, artists, teachers, students, who have walked in and out of here. And unless we slow down and appreciate those signals of real life, we very often miss the significant aspects of it. So along with Henry James, today I'm going to say to us, let's try to be, each of us, one of the people on whom nothing is lost. I am totally, I tell students, there's nothing more fun for me, so it's fine if they do to go down a rabbit hole on a Google search. That to me is sheer joy, because I keep wanting to ask more and more. Uh, it has to stop at a point, but it really is a very creative act. Those algorithms pick up on you. They know you better than you do sometimes, right? So try to be one of the people that nothing is lost, just as the Delphic Sybil, being alert, being aware of what's around us. Any of you are fans of the old Clueless, I know a lot of kids will not know, but kind of my children's generation, Clueless was the thing. Do we know who this is? See, we're not even watching Clueless. Shame on us all. Elton, yes. But that idea of pay attention. I've always got the answers. Of course, he had his own agenda. But that idea of if we pay attention, we are going to be able to engage in a lot of ways. In today's world, we have a lot of access to information. We have scientific information, and we find things that are rational. We also have intuitive ways of learning things. We can't fake knowledge and skills. That's something that is why we educate, because those things cannot be faked. But once we have those skills, we can engage in the thrill of a hunt. And a Doctor Who, or a Sherlock, or in the old Matrix, I'm really sorry that I'm going to have to change her picture because I loved her as the Oracle in the old Matrix series. All kinds of CSI crime shows. All of that information does not necessarily help us engage with a work of art. I can read everything about it. I know Lee Binion, uh, her children. I know her husband, Joe. I've been in their studios. I adore her. Her sister was one of my good friends. I know all of that about Lee Benyon, and I'll try not to leave your camera scope. But if I walk up to that painting and spend just a minute engaging with it, something real happens. And that's the way I want to encourage all of us to start looking at art. We're all film critics, right? We go to a movie, we have all the ideas, we go out to dinner, we come home, we go to school the next day, we stand by the water cooler. Well, I think the director should have done this. Well, I didn't like that. I hate that actor. This actor can really do cool things. But we don't feel that confident 
was speaking out about art. And so cultivating that ability of being aware of what we're seeing and being able to share it with others, I think is vital not only to the pleasure, the aesthetic value of it, but to our mental, physical, actually, well-being as well. This is a slide I used a number of years ago. I was working for the LDS Church, and we were doing uh, a Carl Block, I guess I was at BYU Museum, we were doing a Carl Block exhibition, who was a 19th century artist that the LDS Church has used in a lot of its um, publications. People had seen Carl Block, they knew Carl Block, and we were doing an exhibition to bring the real works of art here. Then I saw this image at the end of one of their publications. This image at the end of one of their publications. <laughs> I, yes, what is it? What is missing? I feel like Sesame Street. Two of these things are not like the others. That these angels are missing wings, their shoulders are covered, and the total integrity of the work of art is diminished. Because Karl Block was a classical master. He purposely did a triangular, a pyramidal mm -hmm. construct because he knows that draws the mind, the eyes together. When they start doing that or they eliminate, li eliminate halos, to me, they may be eliminating some things they consider non-factual, but they're not necessarily true. Art speaks to us about truth. I had a very important donor, and your administrators here will understand what I mean when I said this. I had an exhibition where in the very first hallway, I had a gorgeous work I borrowed from the University of Utah that was an enunciation. That means the angel Gabriel was announcing to Mary that she would be the mother of the Son of God beautiful angel, 16th century. And the family was there, and of course, we're hoping they have a really nice experience, so they give us some money. And immediately, this kid ran up, ran up very close to the painting, and he goes, loudly, angels don't have wings. And he looked at me and just glared, like I was really in trouble because I was displaying a non-truth. And I've always thought about that because we want our children to understand metaphor and symbol. That's the richness of their lives. And I started working on an exhibition called Do Angels Have Wings? Uh, I've since done a different version of it at Springville, and BYU is still waiting to do that exhibition now, 12 years later. But we want, as Maya Angelou said, there's a world of difference between truth and facts. Facts can obscure the truth. So angels don't have wings. I don't know. I've never seen one. But the idea of moving through space with the speed of light, now we might put instead a light beam or something that they can travel instead of wings. So thinking about works that you might be familiar with in art, Beautiful Van Gogh night sky. Does the night sky look like that? What if you're on the grass, there's a little mist in the air, there's not, we very rarely have darkened skies anymore. But to be able to see through those eyes, I am starting to look at research that people are doing that maybe there are different physiological aspects to some of these artists. Um, but the, the Van Gogh or Mona Lisa, you can never get close enough to the Mona Lisa to look at it. The questions forever and ever, why is she smiling? But you know what fascinates me about the Mona Lisa? Back here, it's Leonardo's backgrounds are fascinating. We see world building in video games. Who's doing the video games? We see world building and I've got artists who actually do some of those. Leonardo's backgrounds are real world building. They are not Italy exactly as we see it. Frida Kahlo represented her life and story. But look at these creatures near her. I'm hoping the panther is not really that close. But how amazing is that? 
and the dawn of a new era rising from the sea with this Venus. And as we look, they're ready to put the cloak over her. But we were seeing classical figures that had not been seen since the time of the Greeks and the Romans. And this is just a fun one to me when we talk about facts and truth. I've had a little granddaughter living with me during much of the pandemic. She was only about 13 months. I have a series of the clamped pillows on, on my chair and on my bed. And she picked this one up and she said, kisses, kisses. And I was like, oh, how amazing that she even could tell this is the kiss. But this little one just, I said, do you want kisses, Issa? And she said, kisses. So again, the power of art in whatever subject it may be, but more about what we sense. Of course, we have newer arts. We have different styles. This is a, a New York graphic artist. Uh, Dave Mickle, who's one of our very fine landscape artists, and he was asked to do the Welcome to Salt Lake City posters. And I'm trying right now to raise money to do the art um, from the American Folk Museum of Masonic figures because a lot of Utah art, early Utah art, uses some of the Masonic symbolism. And so, so many things out there. This, this is on the floor at the museum. It's a tar-like substance that trickled down some fish line and we've left on the floor. Our poor little um, janitor, custodial help from Colombia, does not speak English, cannot understand why we are leaving this black mess on the floor of the museum. So I want to tell you a tea house tale. The Japanese tea master, Senno Riku, built a tea house on the side of a hill overlooking the sea. Just imagine in your head how beautiful. Three guests were invited to the inaugural tea ceremony. Hearing about the beautiful site, they expected to find a structure that took advantage of that view. But after arriving at the garden gate, they were perplexed to discover a grove of trees had been planted that obstructed that panorama. Before entering the tea house, however, this is where the importance of tradition and of doing certain symbols, rituals, performances. Before entering the tea house, the guests followed the traditional custom of purifying their hands and mouths at the stone basin near the entry. Stooping to draw water with a bamboo ladle, they noticed an opening in the trees that provided a vision of the sparkling sea. In that humble position, they awakened to the relationship between the cool liquid in the ladle and the ocean in the distance between their individuality and the ocean of life. What a marvelous suggestion to us that sometimes we need to humble ourselves, we need to engage in things that we may not understand and see relevance for, to see beyond the vista, beyond those things that are clouding or obscuring our view to the beautiful sea. I was visiting the Guggenheim a while back. I was there to see an Impressionist show. And they wanted you to go and start up at the very, very top. And that was where the exhibition started. And then you'd spiral your, your way down. We'll talk about a spiral in a minute. And so being the good visitor and museum person, I decided I'm going to kind of follow their thing. But I want to see the whole show. And it's easier to take the elevator up and then walk down. Right? So I got up there and I walked down and I spent several hours looking at these masters of modernism, impressionist art, and I got down to the very, very bottom and came out and there was against a far wall hidden in kind of a dark little alcove this work of art. Obviously it was not part of the show. And yet, I had the most chilling response to it. And I had to just stand there for a minute after I'd been looking at light and free brush strokes 
and I saw this piece over there in the corner, I felt like I was being transported to someplace else. If you look at it, let me put that up. If you look at it, it's a very Christian symbol. It's much more than a little lamb. It is, as Zurbaran called it, the Lamb of God, Agnustei. But you look at it, and white, albeit somewhat, but some of you may even have, have dealt with sheep. My dad used to be a shepherd. But you look here at the bonds here, wrapping around, restricting movement there. The horns even just looking, bending downward on a hard, cold-looking slab. Little eyes, are they eyes open partially in death or are they still open partially in life? It's a beautiful little piece that doesn't need any label to tell me what it is or what's going on. In Christian symbolism, it is the pure love of God, Jesus Christ, that was sacrificed. Not struggling against those cords, not writhing, but very much as in Christian history, accepting that lot for himself. And I love the words of Catherine Thomas, who said, if we are deep enough and quiet enough, we have experience with these ideas that goes beyond the rational mind, engages our spirit, and begins to set up new movement in our souls. A little side note I hadn't thought to tell you until I was just talking to some of the students. I was in Taiwan just a couple of months before the pandemic closed everything down. I'd been invited by the State Department, and they had said, well, we want you to go and speak at um, the Fo Guang Shang Monastery, and uh, can you send us your slides ahead of time so we can make sure they want to know about world religions, and I was doing things for universities and museums. So I just sent them my PowerPoints. I said, you can go through them, see whatever you want to. And when I got to the monastery, they had this up on, the image up on where all of the leadership would meet and train. And they had translated it uh, into Chinese. And it was a very touching moment for me because they were asking about Christian art, and this was the piece that they had used to focus on. So this mindful experience emerged for me as a real area of study when I was with uh, one of uh, another curator, and we were at this museum. If you haven't been up to the Natural History Museum of Utah, up past the university campus, go, 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 go. Uh, take anybody you know, little people especially. It's a marvelous museum that is made for the senses. And I was standing on this bridge with a colleague and we were saying, how do we do this same kind of thing in an art museum? Because usually we have sculpture that has texture, but many things are, are 2D on the wall. And as we were standing there, two men walked up to us, because we were kind of loud Utah women, I guess. And two men walked up to us and said, we're architects from Seattle, and we were kind of listening to what you were talking about. Our whole firm has to align with this book, The Eyes of the Skin, by architect, uh, Finnish architect Giovanni Palasma. And he said, we've taken courses from him. And his idea is this, that a peculiar exchange takes place. In the experience of art, a peculiar exchange takes place I lend my emotions and associations to the space, and the space lends me its atmosphere, which entices and emancipates my perception and thoughts. So when I look at a painting like this, and I don't have to read the label, or as I said in a place like this, but immediately my perceptions are, I remember being in a place like that. I remember what it sounds like. In fact, sometimes at night, I turn on that running water on my phone. I remember what it feels like to hide back in the coolness of those trees. And then I also remember, just as Maria and I were out here crunching on the snow, 
what it feels like when there's a little bit of color left out there, but I'm crunching on the snow. All of a sudden, my whole self is in. I know what Stansfield was thinking. Our young artists, we ask for their artist statements. So important to see where they are. But today I'm talking about we as viewers and appreciators can be. Palazzo says also, and it's not just an architectural, but an artwork is not experienced, experienced as just a series of these optical retinal images, but it's full integrated material embodied. It has a spiritual essence. I believe that a work of art carries an essence of the artist that created it, of those who are viewing it, of everyone that has viewed it. It all comes together as part of the power of a work of art. It offers us shapes and surfaces that are made not for necessarily the touch of the hand, we're doing more of that with our kids, but the touch of the eye. That's such a fabulous, the touch of the eye and other senses, and thus his book is called The Eyes of the Skin. We see with that very largest part of ourself. There is a physical and mental structure that's involved in being able to do this. I have to, again, allow myself to get past some of those mindless things I've thought or some of the things I've learned before and engage with the work at that time. So I don't know what you would do with something like this. I'm dying to go to the Czech Republic to see it. It's an entire space decorated with skulls and bones. It's an ossuary. And to me, when I first saw that, doesn't that just look so elegant? It's kind of this chandelier feeling and crystal. And then I realize it is bones, it is skulls. How is my experience going to change if I walk in that room and expect to see crystal and gold like I saw in the Hermitage or in, in the Catherine Palace, and instead I'm seeing skulls and bones? Where is that going to take my head? Am I going to stop and think about all of those voices that are there? Am I going to really stop and think who, who is being represented here in this work of art? So the role of our body is just more of the plasma to be the center of perception, to allow ourselves to look closely, to study carefully, Study is a huge part of that, but then let our intellectual part combine with the sensory part, with this emotional part, to have a real powerful experience. So then again, when we do happen across a cathedral or an ancient garden, I just taught ancient Egypt, love the gardens that are in some of the tombs because if you're going to live forever, you definitely want to have the beauty of a garden around and animals, servants, or Stonehenge. I just had students turn in what they want to write about this semester and we're going to have to talk on Monday because a third of them want to write about Stonehenge. I, we're all, you know, history channels, sci-fi channels, who did Stonehenge, but we want to find the real signals they are giving us. The new, some of the new scholarship on Stonehenge is that it was later, in its later years, a wellness center. It was a place to come for healing of heart and mind, not just to align with the cosmos. So, as I take students to Europe, this is the most oft-repeated phrase. When they say, oh, we're going to Salisbury. Do we have to go to another cathedral? And yet, if each cathedral, but they're dark, they're evil. In Gothic novels, you read about somebody hiding out and the murders that are going on, and also they're just very boring. They're all big and dark and evil. And yet, they are some of the funnest places on earth to look for these messages. Love the gargoyles, we think. Oh, they're just there, they do the rain. But the gargoyles have such little personalities. Even here, look at this, this devil just always, I, I love to look at the devils at the different cathedrals, weighing 
The souls there as demons from hell are clamoring to drag them down. While the angel, again with wings, is staring placidly out into forever. Oops, what did I do? This one, poor little boar getting pecked at by the birds. You know, this is a, an animal's lover's nightmare. But these cathedrals are colorful. The paintings are bright and beautiful and that they've lasted in this fresco and the color of the stained glass windows. So many times those things that in our minds are dark can be brought to light just by experiencing them, studying them, looking more closely. Some of my favorite photos of Notre Dame are ones of night when it's lit up and you really see what a prominent place it takes in the, the landscape. So I had been teaching, I started actually, I did a theater <clears throat> undergraduate, a theater and film undergraduate. Then raised children, they're still not raised, they're in their 40s and it's, they're still not raised. Um, and I had started, I answered a note, parents, we need somebody to help do, we're doing little art history courses for the kids. Will you come and do art history? And I'm like, yes, yeah, sure. I did have some art history classes at BYU like years ago. So I said I'd do an art history class, and I was showing this, this um, at that point we had this real slide projector, and I was showing this work of Van Gogh's, I have Van Gogh's irises, and kids of course love Van Gogh because Van Gogh had such an interesting life, and for some reason they get really caught up on the Van Gogh in the ear, and who Van Gogh was with, and you know, his letters to his brother Theo, and we talk about all of that information. And then I took my children to the Getty Museum in Malibu and saw this painting down at the end of the hall. It was probably the distance from here to that wall. And the way the light was hitting on it, it looked like a piece of sculpture. And I just started clipping right toward that. I was going to see that up close for the first time. I started running down until some security guard right out of my chest said, stop. And I was kind of like, and I had my pencil in my hand that I'd been taking notes with. But when I got up, the miracle of Van Gogh and why he continues to amaze us is to look at the way he paints. If I just look at those as a bunch of irises, and this is a different one, but look at how sculpted and amazing. When I was in China, they had recreated with 3D some of the Van Goghs that the kids could touch the texture. So technology is amazing right now with art. How are we doing? We've got about five, ten minutes. Is that good? Okay. So our perceptions and our expectations, as we get into that, we always want to look. As Picasso said, what's the problem? Every child is an artist, and I will say every adult is an artist. Every time I would teach an intro to the arts and tell students they were going to have to make, these are college students, we're going to have to make a creative project this semester. And the answer was usually, I'm not an artist. I don't create things. That was the problem, as Picasso said, how to remain an artist once we grow up. That sense of awe and wonder. And uh, these are on the Notre Dame website, uh, not the one up on top, which is a fake kid painting. But these below are on uh, the Notre Dame website of some of the kids that put their art around. And look at those, does that tell the whole story? Yeah, we love the gargoyles. And here's Mary in her blue dress and baby Jesus in red, which is really interesting to me, but does he stand out in the painting? And then to look at the stained glass window, how much time this little person did to include those, include those colors. So to keep that awe and wonder in our lives that we never become so bored by saying, what should I look at? This uh, arrived, uh, my daughter texted this to me yesterday. This is now little Isa, who is 18 months old, and her mommy allows her to choose her own clothes. And which I was always too much into. I want them to look really good when we go out so people think mother's paying attention. 
she lets Issa dress herself, and so she's got the red cap, the pink, the little um, heart skirt, and her little skirt. But then, without saying a word, she walked over and put on her mother's shoes. We've all worn mama's shoes or daddy's shoes, right? But this idea of keeping that little world intact for all of us, that there aren't always strictly right and wrong things when we're talking about our preferences and aesthetics. I really did not like Victorian art. I never liked Victorian art. My grandma had some really bad faded prints in the bedroom where I stayed when I'd go up to Idaho. Really did not like it. And I had this work assigned <coughs> in the class. And as I looked at it, I could do the intellectual part. It's really important. This is a young carpenter stretching. You can see all of his shavings here. You can see his do-rag or his carpenter's bandana looking very much like a crown. A star of Bethlehem but carved into the architecture. His mother is bent over some kind of chest where the artist tells us she had kept the frankincense and myrrh that would be needed for his anointings. And then the shadow cast against his work wall as he stretches in the sun shows the piercing of his hands with his tools. Pretty marvelous work of art, the, the shadow of death. And then again, when I went to the Manchester Art Gallery and saw the work itself, all of the intellectual aspect, all of the information was there and I was ready to experience it and let it have an impact on me, on my heart, even on my body as I stared at it. So many others, I'm going to go through these, again, just the representations of how the more we learn, the better we can appreciate, if not always love things. B.H. Roberts was a historian. We generally know him in Utah as a historian, both of uh, a Mormon historian and of the area. I found this quote of his that just brought it all together for me. Historians, right? Those are the ones that give us the facts, we hope. But he said the best thing about a painting or piece of sculpture is that which cannot be described. That elusive, mysterious quality we call its spirit may arise from something quite apart from its rhetoric or logic or distinction or all that information. It may be even as the voice of God, not in the strong wind, that rends the mountains and breaks the rocks, but in a still, small voice. And I suggest to you, as we study mindfulness and how it relates to art, that being aware, being present in the moment can affect us. As I said, the State Department had invited me to this monastery in Taiwan. And I was kind of like, oh yeah, okay, I'm supposed to tell him about Christian art, I'm supposed to talk to him and be a good little ambassador for the State Department kind of thing. And we walked in kind of underneath, I'll show you in a minute, but as I exited the room and they said, we'll go down the stairs, this was the view that met me. It was one of the most powerful experiences of my life, the beautiful green the temple pieces that are actually kind of little museums in that pagoda style, but an 80-foot Buddha. I'm a Utah girl, a Mormon history, but one of the most profound spiritual, mental, physical experiences was stepping out and looking at that. Isn't that just gorgeous? And again, I had come down through here, the car with the little flags like you see, State Department, let us out. I came in here, came up to the meeting, and then they opened the windows. I walked out on the balcony and saw that. It was absolutely one of the most powerful visual and spiritual experiences of my life. Maybe we're about to close them. Um, I will close with these next couple of slides. In contrast, Charles Darwin wrote his son Francis a letter late in life. And he said, poetry of many kinds gave me great pleasure as a boy. Even as a schoolboy, I took intense delight in Shakespeare and the historical plays. I said that formerly pictures gave me considerable music, very great delight. 
But now, for many years, I cannot endure to read a line of poetry. I have tried lightly to read Shakespeare. I know students, you're maybe with him here, and found it so intolerably dull that it nauseated me. I have also lost almost any taste for pictures or music. My mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding general laws out of large collections of fact. But why this should have caused the atrophy of that part of the brain alone on which the higher taste depend, I cannot conceive. The loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness. We are now in a meaning-driven world. We have things. We have material goods. We have health systems, we have food, we have plenty most of the time, especially where we are. Here's St. Francis who gave all of that up, a painting by Giotto. We're in a transition from material want to meaning want, and it's on an unprecedented scale, and maybe the principal development of our age. The arts teach us first and foremost that unless we open ourselves to what they offer, we can never know all about what being human means. For me, teaching art, sharing art, is about being human. Being human is an art because we can do it badly or wonderfully. I'm going to just go through these. Um, didn't get to the masterful work here, but I do want to show you, these are just fun pictures to look at as we scroll through the idea of the craftsman, but this, let me go back, that when one of Michelangelo's mentors was finishing his work on the oration on the dignity of man, which was a Renaissance principle, he finished his oration with these words, when the work was finished, the craftsman or great architect kept wishing that there were someone to ponder the plan of so great a work, to love its beauty, to wonder at its vastness. Therefore, when everything was done, he finally took thought concerning the creation of man. We have the opportunity to feel, to think, to learn, and to experience. Those have not always been opportunities around the world. Today, they are not opportunities. Right before I went to Taiwan, two years ago, three years ago now, I went to Russia, and I had a marvelous experience. And we were with the tour guides, and just experiencing Russia was beautiful, and I loved it. And my museum has Russian art, Ukrainian art, Georgian art. I had the Georgian ambassador come and visit with me a couple of years ago. Wonderful, wonderful opportunities. But until we start really understanding what it means to be human and the role art can play in our lives and abilities to do that, we are missing so much of the richness, so much of what we have the opportunity every do, day to do here and engage with and appreciate. I hope you'll come and visit us at the museum. I hope maybe I can come down and visit students sometime and we can get into this a little more deeply because I feel very strongly about we have a responsibility to prepare ourselves. Uh, if I were to go on, we'd talk a little bit about meditation and labyrinths and the opportunity, again, to prepare ourselves to receive the wonders that art has to offer us and helping us better understand our humanness and our humaneness with those around us. So thank you very much. <laughs> well, we're, doing questions. we're doing questions. Do we have time? Five, ten minutes? Shoot. You can just make something up. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question. How's that? I'm going to 
Press Dean, who has been a life, a very long time friend to Ed's mom. Do you create art? Yes, I think I do. Yes, you do. Jean does quilts we were just talking about at lunch. And the skill again. But you know, my grandma always said that there was every stitch, there was part of her that went into it. Yeah, yeah. Have you felt that? Oh yes, I do. And memories of people that you've quilted with? Yeah. Anybody else have something that that they want to ask that they create, they do? I want to ask a question but I'm not behind the camera. Okay. <laughs> so how can we help other people understand this that you just talked about? I think one of the main things is supporting the arts in your own area. I believe, in, and later on in the presentation, I would talk about being an advocate for the arts. Because today, every single city council, I was up at the legislature last week for a couple of days, there are opportunities to keep arts in education. A few years ago, the legislature was actually going to take art out of the curriculum for middle school students. And so, whether you are creating art yourself, which you are, we've talked a little bit, wonderful art form that can see things not just as the eye sees it, but you intuitively do some things with it. Whether you're creating art and sharing it, or you're advocating for others to be able to create or learn about art and study it is huge. Because we find it's very quickly to cut, um, that, that city councils will cut art out of the parks, or the legislature can cut art out of programs, and to really convince them that it's important to the whole person, that it makes us human, helps us deal with conflict. Uh, along in here, there, I'm going to go forward to it because I love this little work. And um, this is, <laughs> sorry, but um, I love in down toward the end. Oh, we'll just, I, I will give this to Ellen and you can all go through this a little bit. But I loved this little quote from the Dalai Lama. I will do. This is a book for atheists and he said, Christianity never leaves us in any doubt about what art is for. It's a medium to remind us about what matters. And I spoke with the monks about that and the, as the translator said it, they were just Yes, yes, yes. Art teaches us about what matters. And this little guy, um, this little one, I thought it was great. And, and I think it kind of answers the question of why I feel like it's so important. If every eight-year-old in the world is taught meditation, we would eliminate violence from the world within one generation. If, they, if we all stopped and learn to appreciate and be still for a minute. And that's what we can keep conveying. Our children need this. They need that arts experience. They need to see through different eyes, through different mediums, uh, what it is. And it does really take time and money to go forward, people creating art to share. Really good question. Thank you. Anything else? Ellen, was there anything that that uh, you would hope to we talk about that? Oh, I don't know. Um, I do have one question okay. for you. Um, in terms of parts of the Spring Hill Museum, do you have a favorite area or a place, inside or outside, that you're particularly drawn to, and why? Um, it's the mother question of which of your children do you love the most? <laughs> <laughs> because for me, and I say it sincerely and it's not trying, it is wherever I am. If I stop and actually look, it's possible for me to be in that incredible place and walk by, get to a meeting, pull out something from my secretary. But any place in that whole museum or garden where I take just a minute to stop, get my focus, recognize that I'm making that moment, whatever. I find that I have so many special places, both in front of certain works of art and in the museum. 
Uh, we joke about a museum ghost that some of us hear late at night. But you know what? Those are special moments too because we're aware. And I think that the garden, of course, is for me always when it's the wisterias in bloom. I love it. But I also love uh, when right now I've got student works up and I can just feel some of these students pouring their heart out and it connects with me. But I have to stop and recognize that. And so every place becomes a bit sacred to me in that building. It's, it's the neatest place to work. And wherever you are, and we were going by the dorms, you were showing where the dorms were. Um, some of my favorite memories, I had my first Picasso po poster in my dorm room. And I loved that, and I've kept it now, 50 years later, kind of thing. And every place I lived, there was something that I drove to happen because I stopped and felt it. Yeah, we were just up there last weekend for the student art show, and, and I was thinking how cool it must be to have access to the museum after hours, which you, of course, do, but in the privacy and quiet. It, it's wonderful, and sometimes I'll just stop and say, man, I never noticed that. Or I would walk by it, and seeing some of these when you did the ones before, I was like, oh my goodness. They become like little friends. But they also, they put a responsibility back on me. I'll, I'll tell you a little story that, that I just shared with a couple of you. Up at the legislature last week, uh, we took some of the student art up. And there is a, a work, a photograph, and, and some digital um, changing on it of a young man sitting on the floor with some bright neon lights going past it. And one of the senators asked the assistant in the Senate chamber with President Adams up at the podium, he said, could we bring a work of art up on the screen? And he brought this work of art up on the screen. And he said, you know, we were choosing art for our, our, um, from our district. And I saw this with the go. This is a young man who's got pretty nice urban type clothes and very colorful, kind of chic, cool background. And then he said, but I totally missed the point of it till I read his statement. And then standing on the Senate floor weeping, he said, I have worked with issues of incarceration. And until I read that this young man was saying he was sitting there, not moving because he was afraid if he stood up, he'd be in the wrong place and he'd be arrested because he was black. And he said, I totally missed it when I first looked at that work. But he said, when I took a minute with it, I read what the artist had said, and then I thought about my own life experience working with incarcerated youth. He said, something amazing happened. And right there on the Senate floor, he said, we have to have our children making art and learning about art, essentially, because we will be more humane for it.